So let's continue by looking at um, some of the physical roots of depression, or at least the candidates that we think of as potential physical roots. The things that we can measure, that we can observe in the body that might relate to the manifestation of depression. And there's no one easy answer, so I'll, I'll put that up front. But there are some things that we think are common players in the progression of depressive symptoms. Things like neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. We'll talk about what those uh, specifically do on the next slide. Neurotransmitters involved in reward, fear, um, different regulations, uh, different uh, emotional regulations. If they're dysregulated, obviously could result in uh, varying mood states. The hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, or the HPA axis, is um, a series or a sequence, a cascade of hormonal signals in the body that help you respond to stress in an appropriate way. Dysregulation of this axis might mean that you feel more stressed or less stressed than you're supposed to. Oftentimes, it's the, uh, the former, that you are more stressed in response to uh, um, less of a stimulus or a normal stimulus than you should be. So we'll look at how dysregulation of this axis might feed forward into uh, depressive symptoms as well. And I used to just include this as a blanket statement that there uh, are other associated elements, uh, dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system, so control of breathing, heart rate, temperature might come into play, or changes in inflammation might come into play, and as we just saw briefly, inflammation seems to uh, maybe not play a major role, but certainly be a modifiable factor, something that you can influence with external therapies. By reducing inflammation, we just saw in that meta-analysis that you can also help to treat the symptoms of major depressive disorder, or at least reduce the severity or the, the self-reported severity of major depressive disorder. Overall, complicated interaction between a number of different factors, some things that might not seem related. So let's try to figure out if, uh, if we can get a sense of how or why these things relate to depression. How would these ever connect to depression? <coughs> Let's talk about the uh, neurotransmitters first. Uh, norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. So norepinephrine is a, um, a metabolite of dopamine. So dopamine is metabolized into norepinephrine, and this is um, a sympathetic nervous system messenger. It's generally there to um, signal fight or flight, to enhance alertness, vigilance, energy, um, which isn't really a, a great way to describe it, but restlessness, anxiety, vigor, um, all those things that turn on systems and activate them in response to an external stimulus. So a high release of norepinephrine might make you feel jittery or anxious. If that's the case chronically, that can feed forward into the anxious feelings associated with depression. Now, it might simply be, uh, it might persist because there's a high level of dopamine. It is metabolized um, from normal dopamine metabolism. So if there's more dopamine circulating, then that would necessarily mean more uh, norepinephrine. Dopamine is a uh, reward neurotransmitter released um, in small bursts that signal reward. And uh, this is observable, it's trainable, it's the um, reason that checking off items on a to-do list feels so good. You get a small little burst of dopamine saying, oh, this is something that you should, you should acknowledge as being good or rewarding. And if we can regulate or affect the release of dopamine, then perhaps uh, we can influence depressive symptoms. So things, addictive substances like drugs will chronically help release dopamine. So it's chasing that other release of dopamine. If this is depressed, if there is less dopamine release than normal for whatever reason, then that could lead to the opposite um, complement of feeling. 
the absence of reward, or um, uh, what's another way to describe that? The absence of reward. Um, I can't think of another good way to describe it right now, but we'll we'll get to it. Um, as we talk about serotonin, which is a similar um, neurotransmitter involved in the regulation of uh, mood, appetite, sleepiness, feelings of happiness, and this is often a, a target of antidepressants. So you've heard of uh, SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. SSRIs will block the reuptake of serotonin. You want to store it within neurons to be released at another time. When it is released, it helps uh, feelings of uh, pleasant, elevated mood, happiness. And so with too little serotonin, if we sequester it, if it's stored too tightly, that could um, uh, initiate some feelings of depression as well. So antidepressants as a medication will target the uh, the receptors or the channels that will take back up serotonin and block them, helping to keep it in circulation longer and make these feelings persist longer. <coughs> SSRIs will block reuptake. We'll see one later. Um, sertraline or Zoloft, as it's commonly known, is a, uh, is a common SSRI that blocks the reuptake of serotonin. Very popular antidepressant. Um, another class will prevent this from being degraded. So if it's released from neurons, it's, it's, um, we try to store it, we'll try to break it down, or it floats away so that it can't be uh, in range of the target tissue. So one class of medication will stop this from being reabsorbed. Another class will stop it from being oxidized or broken down. Both have um, similar effects to increase the uh, circulating serotonin. These are all somewhat similar. They have uh, an amine group with different branches on them, methyl groups, acetyl groups, etc. We call these monoamine neurotransmitters. As a class, they have a same or a similar structure, not the same structure, obviously. Monoamine neurotransmitters. These are linear. If they are released, they have a certain series of effects. If they are not there, then those effects are absent. And so we might be able to regulate feelings of depression by regulating the appearance of these neurotransmitters. Why these are imbalanced is a more difficult question. To understand their release, their storage, how they might... Um, how their, their release might be affected um, abnormally. We have to try to understand the wiring of the brain, and this is a, a, a simplified schematic, as complicated as it looks, it's a simplified schematic, just showing you the interrelation or the interconnections between different areas of the brain. These are subcortical regions, meaning simply they are below the cortex, subcortical, they're below conscious awareness, and these are automatically regulated. You can think of these as the, um, uh, the lizard brain, the animal brain, the, uh, the base instincts of, uh, of the body. And I don't bring this up for you to memorize all these different uh, acronyms or the wiring pathways. I just want to point out that uh, these structures are involved in reward, fear, memory, planning, and if they are irregularly activated, that could lead to feelings of depression. If you're uh, chronically fearful or if there's no feelings of reward, you might start to feel, why is it worth it? It might feed into feelings of depression. So these subcortical structures are all involved in these basic feelings, reward, fear, motivation. And these subcortical structures, being uh, parts of these responses or these feelings, all receive input from areas related to those uh, monoamine neurotransmitters that we just talked about. So the light blue lines are all pathways or neurons that are dopaminergic, that release dopamine. And so dopamine in various 
forms at various times will influence the amygdala, will influence the nucleus accumbens in the, uh, the thalamus, and has inputs to the prefrontal cortex as well. So these feelings of, um, of reward, we can sense them, we know when we feel rewarded, and they have many different, um, uh, the circuitry is, is varied and spread out between these subcortical regions as well. So you can start to see how imbalance in the activation of these neurons might affect a variety of different moods or feelings. And similarly, the yellow lines are norepinephrine and serotonin-related neurons. 5-HT is the uh, metabolite, the active form of serotonin in the body. These will uh, release and activate again the amygdala, the nucleus accumbens, the prefrontal cortex, all in response to um, whatever signals activate them. So how these are initiated, how these are activated becomes an important question. Are they chronically upregulated? Are they chronically downregulated? Are they modified by other neurons? We haven't talked about all of these, and that's fine. We're not going to. Um, just note that the circuitry is complex. There's a lot of overlap. And whether a structure is activated or not depends on the balance of the signals it receives. There's a lot of dopaminergic input that might activate or inhibit. It might counteract the effects of the other neurons. So it's complicated. Uh, overlapping circuitry. That is, the uh, monoamine neurotransmitters have widespread effects. Think of it that way. How would we connect these subcortical regions to the rest of the body? Yes, individual feelings might be affected, but there are widespread visceral physical effects that can be measured. And this is where the HPA axis comes into play the hypothalamic pituitary axis. We saw on the last slide the hypothalamus was central to that circuitry, the, uh, the neurotransmitter circuitry. And we see it on this slide in this uh, red circle. This is the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. You don't need to remember the PVN stands for paraventricular nucleus. Just know that the hypothalamus is the starting point for the HPA axis. It's the starting point for the stress response in this case. Hypothalamus will, when it's activated, initiate a stress response that activates other structures in the body. And usually this is good. You're stressed when something is a challenge and you need to activate different structures in the body to be able to complete or meet that challenge. A definition of challenge, though, changes in our increasingly sedentary society. It's not a challenge anymore to write a paper in a day, or that's what we consider a challenge when this axis might have been activated in the past to escape a saber-toothed tiger that was trying to chase you down. So our definition of challenge has changed somewhat, but the pathway remains active when we perceive something as a challenge. So the hypothalamus might be activated by those neurotransmitters we just talked about. And when it's activated, it initiates the uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis. So the hypothalamic pituitary axis. The hypothalamus activates the pituitary, which has widespread effects within the body. And the hypothalamus is actually connected to the pituitary. You remember this from... Anatomy and physiology, right? The infundibulum, little projection, fun word to say as well, right? Infundibulum, little projection connecting the hypothalamus to the pituitary. When the hypothalamus is activated, it releases corticotropin releasing factor. Corticotropin releasing factor releases uh, corticotropin. That uh, downstream factor will move to the kidneys, the adrenal cortex specifically, adrenal on top of the renal organ, adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, will spread throughout the body and ultimately target 
the adrenal glands to release some other substance. So this cascade of events, this cascade of hormones is triggered in response to the hypothalamus being activated in stressful situations. In stressful situations. We will register that in the blood as higher glucocorticoids, uh, one of which is cortisol, also known as the stress hormone. Chronic high cortisol is an example of a glucocorticoid that you can measure in circulation in stressful situations. When this axis is persistently activated, we get persistent release of all of the intermediaries. Corticotropin releasing factor, adrenocorticotropic hormone, and then the variety of <coughs> glucocorticoids that are released by the adrenal gland. If this is persistently activated, those factors are persistently released. Okay, that's fine. If they're persistently released, that just means the axis is always on. You're always feeling stressed. Maybe that's good. Maybe your life is challenging and you need to, you need to rise to the challenge. Maybe it's bad. I'm going to argue that it's bad. As this is persistently activated, circulating cortisol, circulating glucocorticoids are sensed by the brain. Normally, that sensing will turn off the HPA axis. In classic negative feedback loop style, the end point of the feedback loop should turn off the initial signal these glucocorticoids should go back and inhibit the hypothalamus. Presumably, we've activated the hypothalamus to achieve some goal. That goal would be the release of glucocorticoids. Their presence is evidence that the axis was activated. And so now it can signal, oh, let's turn that axis off. Normally, it would inhibit the hypothalamus. For some reason, in major depressive disorder, that inhibition is minimal. For some reason, the effects are lost, or they're overridden, perhaps. Maybe they're overridden by um, those neurotransmitters we just talked about that are always trying to activate this axis. We're not exactly sure why. But the end result is these circulate in high levels, their attempts to turn off the HPA axis go unheard, and so they have secondary effects which are to negatively impact other structures of the brain. Here you can see the hippocampus is negatively impacted by that circulating cortisol. The negative impacts are to cause that structure to atrophy shrink in size. It can affect the neurons within the hippocampus. High circulating cortisol, persistently <laughs> stressful situations, can actually cause parts of your brain to shrink. And in the brain, structure belies function. The, the larger the structure, the more neurons there are, the more complex the, uh, the signaling between neurons, and generally the more functional that area is. So if it shrinks, that area loses neurons, it loses mass, it becomes less functional. And the hippocampus has roles in uh, how we perceive time, in planning, in memory, in imagining, uh, imagining the future, remembering the past, it has a whole host of different functions. So those would be negatively impacted in these chronically stressful situations. It's complicated. There are widespread effects of what seems to be a simple <coughs> dysregulation. This pathway is always turned on. Okay, well, we'll live with it. But living with it means you've got these persistent and perhaps damaging effects that will be... Uh, perceived or felt long-term in the brain. This is 
an interesting point to connect what would be activation or repression of a circuit with the physical uh, existence of that circuit. Neurotransmitters would turn on or turn off a circuit. Here we're starting to see how the circuitry itself can be affected. And that brings us to the third prong in this uh, fork of physical, um, physical pathways underpinning depression, which is uh, the neurotrophic hypothesis that there are elements that are released, molecules that can be sensed that help to regulate the circuitry of the brain. Not just that it's turned on, not just that there are hormones, but that the brain is always rewiring. <coughs> when you learn a new skill, the brain rewires. When you forget that skill, the brain rewires. When you learn new information in clinical exercise physiology, your brain rewires. So it's rewiring right now. And the ability to rewire is actually a, a hallmark of a healthy brain. That flexibility, that plasticity is good. So how might this work in the context of depression and the elements that we've talked about so far? So what you're looking at here is um, a basic neuron in the brain. It's a pyramidal neuron. It's a type of neuron that has many branches that allows signals to be sent. We don't care about the specifics other than this is uh, an example of neurons in the brain. And, you know, the, the dendrites, the body, the axon, you know, signals come in at the dendrites. The, uh, the body will relate an action potential, and the signal is sent by the axon. So that should be fairly straightforward. What we have on the top is uh, a zoomed-in portion of some of the dendrites, and there's all these different areas where other neurons can connect. And they're not all occupied, and that's fine. They don't all need to be occupied. They're occupied because you have a certain skill, you have a certain understanding, and this is relatively unchanging right now. What are the factors that would affect this branching? Primarily, central to this hypothesis is BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Not a very eloquent name. It's a factor that's involved in the neurotrophic hypothesis, that is the branching of neurons, and it comes from the brain. It's produced by the brain. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So brain-derived neurotrophic factor, if it's circulating, if it's evident, will activate these neurons and regulate or, or affect branching in some way. Here we see a normal amount of BDNF, and we see a normal style or amount of branching. Down below, there are other factors that affect whether the neuron will be more or less active. You can see monoamines, which are the neurotransmitters that we just talked about, glutamate, some other things. And I want to point out uh, CREB, C-R-E-B, is um, it's a factor involved in, in DNA translation, cyclic AMP response element binding protein. And I didn't put it up here because you don't need to remember that. Just know that BDNF will make, um, will translate some DNA. We'll translate some DNA, we'll produce some proteins through the actions of CREB. That's how the branching is executed. So if we understand that BDNF is central to this branching hypothesis, what happens if we change the amount of BDNF or the activity of BDNF? In a situation where you are stressed and or depressed, Remember, high circulating cortisol, which is a glucocorticoid, will come in and impact, will disrupt this normal signaling. It prevents BDNF from making proteins through CREB. It dislodges 
Kreb from the DNA. And so high circulating glucocorticoids means there's less proteins produced. BDNF has less of a role, which means all of a sudden fewer branches reduced what's called arborizations. If you imagine the, the branching of neurons as a tree, the branches of a tree, reduced arborizations. In effect, secondary to this high persistent circulating cortisol level. This is how that atrophy is mediated. The glucocorticoids will disrupt normal BDNF function, and so we'll have fewer connections between neurons. We'll start to forget things, the brain atrophies, those areas shrink in size. And the opposite is true as well. If you are somehow able to boost the effects of BDNF, you get increased or enhanced branching. There are more sites for other neurons to connect. There are more connections to be observed. More BD BDNF is circulating. There's more proteins being produced. And this is what is uh, typical of a treated state. The question here is how do we achieve this treated state? What factors would affect BDNF release? Well, any medications that will affect monoamine release, specific types of monoamines, would affect BDNF activity. So the SSRIs that we talked about, allowing serotonin to be uh, available in between the neurons circulating, would boost the effect of BDNF. Other good news, we've measured this. BDNF is, uh, is uh, produced in response to exercise, which is kind of odd. Why would exercise, going for a run, produce more brain-derived neurotrophic factor? I don't know if we have the answer to that right now, but maybe we don't need to, because as long as we know that it does, that positions exercise quite well as an effective therapy for treating the reduced arborizations or characteristic of a depressive uh, state. So exercise might be an effective therapy for, if not other reasons, this reason. Enhanced BDNF release, more connections between neurons, helping to alleviate the, uh, the atrophy associated with chronic stress. Uh, this is sort of a, a chicken and the egg scenario. We're not really sure if, if BDNF is the reason for a change in oppressive symptoms, if less or more would result in a depressed state or a treated state, or if it's a secondary effect. Some other, um, the ability to treat depression, if that means BDNF will follow suit afterwards. We're not sure which is which. There's no cause and effect that uh, I think we've been able to understand yet. So exercise, positioned well to help treat depression, which is good news as long as you can motivate yourself to exercise in that situation. The, um, the short of it, and we'll look at the results on Tuesday as we explore the papers in a bit more detail, depressive symptoms are generally minimized or reduced with greater fitness and greater activity. We'll see that coming up. But it's a proportional response. More fitness or more activity means less depressive symptoms. I'm going to show you that the effects are similar to those achieved with medication. Medication is one way to treat. Exercise is another way to treat. Both of them are equally effective and there's some potential that they can be um, synergistic or have an additive effect. There's even the argument that exercise is better because it, it seems to persist long-term, there's less relapse, the effects are 
uh, more long-lived with exercise than with medication. But I'll show you some, uh, uh, some work that compares the two. And I don't remember why I put this point on this slide. This is a, this is a, a clinical testing, a clinical considerations point. I think this should be on another slide at the end. Remember this when we get to our um, considerations for clinical exercise testing. These first two points are what I'm going to show you that justifies exercise's use in depression. This is be careful when administering exercise or evaluating fitness in a depressed person. More so because when you're doing a VO2 max test, a graded exercise test to test or evaluate fitness, having done them before, you know that it takes a high degree of motivation to reach that second last and the last stage of the graded exercise test. And being a motivational condition or a condition that would impact motivation, it might not be easy to make that choice to reach the maximal level for an individual with depression. And therefore, your results might be biased or underestimate their fitness. So that third point is separate from the ideals proposed by the first two. Still important, but it's meant to go with another slide. So let's look at uh, some of the, the work that backs up exercise as a therapy for depression. And we're going to turn our attention to some epidemiological data back to the ACLS, the Aerobic Center Longitudinal Study. Um, here we have 100,000 subjects. Start a collection in 1970, and this is in 2016, 2006. Um, 100,000 subjects overall, but we're looking at six, a subset of 6,000 that have reported depressive symptoms. We're looking at cardiorespiratory fitness in men and in women, and then physical activity in men and in women. Both are not uh, the same. They are different, but you'll notice an improvement with more fitness, an improvement with more physical activity. In both men and women, there's a stepwise reduction in depressive symptoms as measured by the CESD, the Center for Epidemiological Studies Scale of Depression. This is very similar to the HAMD or the Beck Depression Inventory, those questionnaires that we looked at last class. A higher number means more depressive symptoms. A lower number is better. And we see a stepwise reduction where at uh, moderate and higher fitness, the uh, scoring is lower in men and in women. And then with sufficient activity, the scores are lower in men and in women. <clears throat> whatever sufficient activity means. We'll actually figure out what sufficient activity means with one of the papers we're looking at on Tuesday. So We'll call this the public health dose, your 10,000 steps per day or um, what is it, 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity activity, the public health guidelines. That's what we'll call sufficient activity in this case. Also note um, that discrepancy, the disparity that we pointed out last class of men versus women holds up here as well. Higher reported <coughs> symptoms of depression in women at any given point in time, even with higher fitness, even with higher or sufficient activity, either because women tend to be more depressed or they're simply more truthful. Impossible to know from this, uh, from this data because the questionnaires are subjective. But uh, it does hold up. The disparity does hold up. Women rate as more depressed than men. Uh, the important point to take away from this, though, is that fitness seems to <clears throat> relate to lower depressive uh, scores and activity, physical activity, relates to lower depressive scores. We don't know, and this is important, we don't know that if you are at a low fitness, and then you become fit, if that means your scores will drop. It might be that, or it could simply be that you feel better about having a high fitness, you're happier, and therefore are less depressed. 
There's no cause and effect here. These two things happen to be related. It doesn't mean that if you're active, your depressive scores will drop. It could be that if you're less depressed, you get out of the house more often and you're more active. You can't tell. And so we run an intervention study to see what happens when we administer exercise, we administer uh, medication. How do scores change? Here we're looking at HAMD scores, the Hamilton Rating Scale of Depression. This is a four-month intervention, home-based exercise versus supervised exercise. And the exercise is shown here, 30 minutes, three days per week at a moderate intensity, 70 to 85% of heart rate reserve, which is about 60, 65% of VO2 max. Actually, that's not true. 65 to 75% of VO2 max. This generally equates with heart rate, uh, with VO2 reserve, and uh, the difference between VO2 reserve and VO2 max is minimal. Regardless, we're comparing exercise to medication. Sertraline, in this case, which is the SSRI that we identified, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, also known as Zoloft. And then a placebo, sugar pill, doesn't do anything, no exercise in this group. See how depressive symptoms change over four months. So what are we looking at? These are the scores at four months. Hamilton rating scale scores at four months, everyone is in the roughly nine to 10 range. This doesn't tell us a lot about how the scores changed over four months. To do that, I need to superimpose the original scores for each group. The original scores were all in the 16 to 17 range, so off of this scale. Four months of treatment reduced the scores by, uh, what is that, a third? Almost a half? Let's call it a third. Seven out of 17, whatever that is. two-fifths. Regardless, a nice reduction across the board. Home-based exercise, supervised exercise, medication, and placebo. Scores all went down. Note, we did um, discuss the HAMD a bit more in detail at the start, that a score of eight is the threshold where HAMD classifies you as having major depressive disorder or not. If you score above eight, have major depressive disorder. If you score under eight, you don't have major depressive disorder. So these individuals, though their scores have improved, are all still technically depressed after four months. Hopefully with persistent treatment, these scores would lower even further and there'd be uh, a greater improvement and higher remission rate. But this is pretty powerful, right? Because there's a couple things that we can, we can interpret or that we can pull out of the study. Let's talk about exercise first. So exercise is an effective treatment and it doesn't matter if it's home-based or if it's supervised. I don't know if I have the compliance data. No, but typically you'd expect home-based exercise. It's easier to miss, miss a day, right? No one's holding you accountable. Easy to miss a day of exercise if you're the only one that's involved in the exercise. Regardless, that treatment still worked. Exercise was effective in reducing depressive scores. It was as effective as medication. It was as effective as medication. Now, that might be good, it might not be good, we don't know if it's additive at this point in time, but it's as effective as medication, um, which I'll leave you to interpret. If we draw out the results a year post-test, and I pulled this out of the paper, remission rates tended to be higher with exercise. That is, more individuals had a score lower than eight one year after the, the trial was done. So at a one-year follow-up, more individuals in the exercise groups 
we're below this red line. So while at four months it seems as though they're equal, there seems to be an edge to exercise at a one-year follow-up. There's a greater remission. More individuals were below the red line, didn't classify as having major depressive disorder in the exercise groups versus medication. So edge to exercise in this case. But I don't think those are the most interesting findings. What's the most interesting finding on this slide? Is what lower? The remission. remission rates versus placebo. So 45% of the individuals in the exercise group versus 30% in the medication group were in remission at one year. Does that make sense? So medication or the placebo group? Not the placebo group. In the medication group. 30% okay. in the medication. 45% in the exercise groups. Okay. I don't know if there are numbers for the placebo group, for remission. No difference between the exercise groups. Yeah, that's a good question. I'll, I'll go pull that number out because there should be a comparable number for the placebo group as well, unless it's zero, which I doubt. But it might be. I'll go back and look at that. But these numbers are for the exercise and the medication groups. These are of the people in those groups, a higher percentage were in remission at one year having exercised versus taking the medication. So that helps clarify. The message is still intact. But it does kind of point at the finding that I was uh, hoping to draw. What's the most interesting thing about this figure? Yeah. They did nothing tangible, yet their scores decreased from 17 to 11. Or maybe we need to redefine what it means to be tangible. What is a tangible action? So the placebo group that didn't get any pharmacological intervention, that didn't participate in exercise, still felt better at the end of four months. Why? Why is there a placebo effect in this case? Okay. Okay, good. So, so the placebo effect um, might have led them to think, oh, <clears throat> led them to have the expectation that they should get better. Yeah. And so that helped to alleviate some of their symptoms. And then maybe some of the, we're not capturing some of the physical activity information in these measurements. We don't have an assessment of physical activity or sociability or running errands, things like that that might help them have a greater sense of mastery over their own life, perhaps. And maybe participation in the study was enough to say, enough, I'm doing something. <clears throat> and who's to say that that's not a tangible effect, right? For an individual that might not feel reward ever, that might have... Uh, just these general feelings of anxiety or fear or whatever the depressed symptoms are to be a participant in a study and whether you're getting a treatment or not, expecting the treatment, maybe the expectation is enough. And that's pretty powerful. And I think that really, that really highlights how little we know about what causes these symptoms because I can point to neurotransmitters and um, uh, endocrine pathways and branching in the brain and say, well, these change in depression, but how do you ever measure an expectation? Because that seems to have an effect as well. Mind's a powerful thing. So that's really interesting. Even a placebo group 
it's on effect. And um, there's a whole, there's a ton of really interesting data on placebos in general. And um, I had a, an honor student a couple of years ago that uh, was looking at an unblinded placebo. Because there's a sense now that even these individuals didn't know they were taking a sugar pill or taking a placebo. They expected that the, uh, the, the medication would work, that they were getting medication. Maybe that's why there's a placebo effect. There's increasing evidence now to say, even if you know that you are taking a placebo, it can still have an effect. Even if you know this is a junk pill, the action of taking the pill can still have an effect. Maybe it's meeting with a physician or meeting with a, a, a doctor. Maybe it's just the action of doing something. Even if you know it's not supposed to do anything and it's made clear to you at the outset, that can still have an effect. An unblinded placebo can have an effect. What? That's cutting edge placebo research. There's a ton of stuff to decode in that area. But even knowing that there's nothing that's supposed to happen, you can still register a benefit. And I'm as bewildered about that as you are. I think that's super cool. So exercise, as effective as medication, as effective as placebo. Placebo worked too. Hmm. What else might impact depressive symptoms? And now we're, we're going off on tangents a little bit, but I thought this was kind of cool. Um, because we had talked about oxidative stress previously. And I want to add to the idea that it's a multifactorial uh, series of physical consequences that might impact depressive symptoms. Maybe oxidative stress plays a role as well. Oxidative stress seems to impact everything else. Insulin resistance, signaling, diabetes. Why not impact depression? And so this is, um, this is a study in rats looking at the impact of oxidative stress on depressive symptoms. And you'll remember from our discussions in the diabetes and obesity section, uh, oxidative stress were, um, was a, a higher production of free radicals that affected how proteins worked. It disrupted uh, phosphate groups or the shape of the proteins, and so it didn't work as intended. And so oxidative stress is generally bad. The only thing you need to know on this slide is that BSO is something administered to the rats that increases oxidant damage. So it was artificially induced oxidative stress. By injecting this BSO compound, they made oxidative stress happen. So there's four groups. We have a sedentary control group, rats that just hang out. There are rats that are forced to run on a treadmill, the exercise control group. Then there are the groups that receive this oxidant inducer. Uh, a sedentary group that had oxidative stress induced, and then oxidative stress plus exercise. So the first two groups now replicated again or repeated with oxidative damage. Four weeks, exercise plus or minus a BSO injection to uh, indicate oxidative stress. Now it's difficult in rats to administer a HAMD, right? Tell me, Mr. Rat, about your feelings of depression. It's impossible to administer a questionnaire to a rat and ask them about uh, their HAMD scores. So we get creative in our assessment of depressive symptoms in rats. What you're looking at on this graph is percent of time in the center of the cage. With a group of rats all contained within a cage, percent of time in the center of the cage is a measure of sociability. And we would assume that if you're feeling more social, you're feeling less depressed. And the opposite is true. If you're feeling less social, you might be feeling more depressed. You might spend less time in the center of the cage, more time in the corners. That's our indicator here of depression. What's important to note is that inducing oxidant damage lowered the time spent socializing. 
and then concurrent exercise alleviates the tendency for oxidant damage to induce depression. So maybe there's a role for oxidative stress in depression as well. Those rats with oxidative stress seem to be more depressed, and exercise had a protective effect. Well, that's good news. But maybe time spent in the center of the cage isn't the best indicator of depression. What about a, a better biological determinant of sociability? The number of litters reared. When you, come, when you think about it, you come down to it, that's the paramount <laughs> measure of sociability, right? If you find, attract, and successfully secure a mate. Again, the same thing occurs. High oxidant damage, for whatever reason, means fewer pups uh, reared. Exercise had a protective effect, completely restoring the number of litters reared in these uh, high oxidant damage rats. And markers for oxidant damage follow the exact same pattern. You look in the blood, you look in muscle, you look in the brain. There was more damage in the oxidant damage case, and then it was protected against with exercise. How? We don't know. That it happened is pretty important. If depression has an oxidant stress aspect or element, you can protect against it or correct it with exercise if these results translate to humans. So how do we think exercise ameliorates depressive symptoms? Uh, I didn't show you any measures of this, but we think that it helps to regulate or normalize release of neurotransmitters, the monoamine theory of depression. We get a sense from um, some of the placebos that the expectation of treatment is also playing a role. Exercise might add to that because not only do you have the benefits of exercise, but you have the expectation exercise would work. You realize the feelings of self-efficacy, of self-worth. Self you feel good about exercising. Those feelings in and of themselves might help to alleviate some of the symptoms of depression. Exercise might help distract from deep, dark thoughts. You need to exercise somewhere. If it's at home, fine. You're in a different room, you're doing an activity. If it's out in the community, even better. You're seeing different things, you're seeing different people. It might help to distract from negative emotions. Exercise does, I didn't show you this work either, but it does induce the release of BDNF. If BDNF is causatory in helping the brain branch and having an effect on depressive symptoms, then certainly exercise would affect depression in that way. Exercise seems to protect against oxidative stress. And there are a host of reasons why inflammation is reduced with exercise. Inflammation, um, we're starting to use it as a blanket term to talk about persistent negative signals. There's some inflammatory signals that are sent from adipose tissue, some from damaged tissue. Exercise, uh, muscle also sends signals, but they tend to be positive. So we call them anti-inflammatory. There are a number of really good signals that offset inflammation. I'd love to see in that meta-analysis an assessment of the inflammation in response to exercise and how that mediates depressive symptoms as well. Um, let me summarize real quick. I used to throw this slide up. We've talked about all this stuff already. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about it again. That slide was the clinical consideration slide. So if you are testing someone with depression, what do you need to do? We're not going to focus on that right now. In conclusion, I think we really did focus on and summarize most of these in these past few slides already. Um, 
In conclusion, for depression, there's, there's a myriad of options. Exercise isn't the only one. Cognitive behavioral therapy, very effective. We haven't even touched on that in this section. Medication, effective. Maybe not the most holistic or preferred method of treatment, but it's undeniable that it works. And so if having some effect is better than the downside of taking medication, certainly on the short term, medication, fantastic, excellent therapy. Exercise, obvious therapy. Whether these are all independent and or if they have combined effects, we're not sure yet. I'm certain there's probably some combined effects, but many treatments decrease depressive symptoms. Moderate exercise specifically, and we'll see this in class on Tuesday, is related to and actively reduces depression scores. Moderate exercise in the order of 65% of VO2 max, 70 to 75% of heart rate reserve, um, a lot like hypertension, moderate intensity exercise that's considered adequate or sufficient specifically reduces depression scores. I can't say that there's one mechanism at play. I've given you a number of candidates. Neurotransmitters, the HPA axis, um, neurotrophic factors and branching in the brain, oxidative stress, it's probably all of them. And it's probably more of them. That list is not exhaustive. When we talk about placebos and the emotional aspect, the expectation aspect, that's not on this list at all. The mechanism is unclear. And so maybe that justifies or, or uh, should push us towards a more comprehensive therapy like exercise that has energy demand, that targets all systems at once, and not something that is generally singular like a medication therapy might be. And we can't deny the, the fact that there's more that we don't understand here. The intangible factors associated with the placebo effect, there's such a large black box that we don't understand here that is um, promising and um, provides a lot of grounds for research in future. That's one of the coolest findings, I think, in this section. The placebo effect is real and can improve depression scores. So when we come to class on Tuesday, we're following the format I laid out um, last class. We're going to look at these two papers. Paper one, done 2005, exercise treatment for depression. This is a dose response study. How effective is exercise and what level of exercise is required to reach that effectiveness? And then we're going to look at um, comparisons in, in remission and recovery. So 10 months rounded off to a year post, uh, post treatment. How does exercise compare to um, medication? And I think there's a combination of the two as well in that Babiak study. So to get a, a nice comprehensive picture of exercise and medication and treatment of depression. So we'll do that on Tuesday. Um, all the forms are online. The uh, instructions are online. Read the papers. Each person, each student reads one paper. You'll have time in your groups to discuss. And then we swap, um, mix the groups up, and then swap stories. Any questions?